I think I got it to work. <laughs> Yeah, it says so. The webinar is now streaming live on Facebook. Nice job. All right. Awesome. And I think we'll, I think I can switch. Okie dokie. I think we are getting ready to go. Thank you all who are here for joining us and thanks to everyone joining us on Facebook Live for our uh, event tonight. Um, we will be getting started here with T in just a second. Will I see them or are they just? They're just panel like attendees, yeah. Okay. So, yep. They can see see you though. <laughs> oh, they can see me. Yep, yep. <laughs> and hi, Jim. <laughs> I got your, I see your chat there, Jim. Can they talk to me or is it all? They, they, they can uh, type messages in the chat and then um, and we'll, when we get to the question parts, that's where we can read questions off at. Okay. See you're on here, Leanne. Hi, Leanne. Marty, how you doing, Marty? Steve. Is there two of me on here? Do you see two? Uh, somehow, I don't know how that happened. Huh. I remove it. I think we're okay. Oh, is it Again, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. We will get started here in just a moment, um, in about a minute. Uh, so hang in with us. Well, it is seven o'clock, so I will get us started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight for the Newton Public Library uh, Photography Group uh, program tonight with uh, T. Walton. Uh, and we are excited for him to be here. Uh, Sam was not able to join us, so I have uh, stepped in uh, for this evening. My name is Dan and I am the uh, adult services supervisor at, at the library and we will uh, be getting started here in uh, right now. So I'm going to pass it over to T and let him uh, tell us about the program and get us started tonight. And thank you for joining us. Sure. So uh, I'm honored to be here. It's the first time I've been, been back to Newton in, oh, about six years. Um, we seem to be doing a lot of this Zoom thing, especially uh, in the past year or so. And uh, as I was talking to Dan, 
uh, a lot of us who don't understand technology, and I'm talking about me, uh, had some difficult times with Zoom, but we eventually figured it out and uh, we use it an awful lot. I serve on a couple of boards and of course all our board meetings are done on, on Zoom. So you really had to get with the pro program or, or you'd be left out. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna show you some photographs that I've taken since I've come to Washington. Uh, I've never considered myself a photographer. I've only considered myself a picture taker because I don't have the talents and skills that so many photographers do. But I see things and I like what I see and I take pictures of them. And uh, I enjoy them and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. So I'll try to figure out, I'll try to share my screen here. Is it sharing, Dan? I can see it. Uh, let me know in the chat if you can't see it. Is it good? Good to go? I think so. I think we're good to go. Well, of course, our journey started from uh, Newton, Kansas. Uh, I came to Newton back in 1973. I actually was born on Long Island and raised there about, oh, 30 miles from the city. And I came to college in Salina, Kansas back in 1969. And when I graduated in 73, I moved to Newton. I've been in, I was in Newton all the way through until I left to come to Washington. So I, I guess I've kind of made the trip from one coast to the other. Karen and I always will consider Newton as our our real home, because that's where we made so many friends and so many acquaintances. As many of you remember, uh, Karen had Karen's Kitchen in Newton. Uh, Karen's Kitchen was there for seven years. It was a great place. Uh, in the mornings, if you were looking for a law enforcement officer, we would be at the kitchen in the morning drinking coffee. And we had highway patrol, city cops, sheriff deputies, we had preachers. We had just about everybody from the community that could come to the kitchen. They had questions. We could talk to them. They were everybody was invited. We put all the tables together, and uh, that's where we would meet at Karen's kitchen. I joined the Newton Police Department back in the '80s, and uh, it made it my career. I stayed with the police department, and then eventually. Uh, ran for sheriff in 2008, and I served two terms as, as sheriff. It was a, uh, a great, great experience. The reason that we came to Washington was that my son was living out here with his wife and they had a baby, Cara. And Karen and I decided we need to be with them and I wanted to be with a granddaughter. So she, my son, and my daughter-in-law was the reason we came to Washington. Never knew anything about Washington before, just got up and left. In fact, we had sold our house in November of 2016 on a Thursday, and we signed the papers at about 11 o'clock. By one o'clock that afternoon, Karen and I were on the road heading out to Washington. We've been here to see Cara's, every Cara's birthday, every birthday that Cara's had. Uh, even this last one with the COVID, although we couldn't actually get together, uh, we were able to go to a park and be with her and uh, we just love her. It's gotten to the point now where every time she's around, I've got a camera and she goes, grandpa, put the camera down. So. She's one of my favorite people to photograph. This is Washington. Washington has a lot of trees, a whole lot of trees. In fact, the lumber, the lumber business is uh, one of the parts of the economy for Washington. Loads and loads of trees. And those trees show up on log trucks every day. Everyday log trucks come into the port of Olympia. 
We actually live in Lacey. Olympia is the state capital, um, but there's three cities that are all closely bound together. In fact, you have a hard time figuring out where the boundary lines lay between Olympia, Lacey, and Tumwater. In uh, Olympia, it sits off of the Puget Sound. So they bring in these log trucks to uh, load onto huge ships. They strip off the bark, they grade each log, and then they load them up on these huge ships. And those logs go out to uh, South Korea, they go to Japan, they go to China, they go to Vietnam. So all of our lumber, our trees are going overseas. When the log companies come through and they chop down a lot of the trees, they, they do replant. And normally they'll sell off the logged land for next to nothing. And uh, that land becomes state parks, sometimes federal uh, preserves. And they're a great area. They have trails through them. You can walk through them. It's absolutely stunning and beautiful out here. That's Karen, and she's standing by one of the trees that didn't get logged down. That's the, the old growth. And these things are monsters. There are certain areas in the state where they have preserved the, the forests and they have not logged the old growth. And they are absolutely massive, massive trees. This place here is called Hurricane Ridge. Hurricane Ridge is about 5,300 feet uh, high or in, in the elevation. What you're looking at there is the Olympia Mountain Range. It's a beautiful site. If you're a landscape photographer, you would love being up there with the clouds, the shadows, or the mountains, the snow. And again, that's uh, taken from uh, Hurricane Ridge, just to show you the, the massive amounts of trees. There's parts of Washington where nobody's walked. An interesting tidbit is that we have the most sightings of Bigfoot or Sasquatch than any other place in the United States. And you can see why, because they could hide anywhere in there if they exist. In fact, they have even made a law here in Washington that you cannot shoot a Bigfoot. It's a felony and they're protected. So don't get any ideas that you're gonna to come to Washington and hunt one of these things up because you can't. Again, that's Hurricane Ridge. There's always snow on top of the mountains. We actually still have glaciers out here. Uh, some of those are glaciers on the top of the mountain. It's just a beautiful area. The road going up there is pretty narrow and uh, you don't really, you, you really want to pay attention to your driving and, and not be looking at your cell phone or anything or else you'll go down 5,000 feet and that wouldn't be fun. As I was saying, we are uh, close to Olympia. Olympia is actually about 10 miles from where we live and Olympia is the state capital we live in a different kind of area, different from uh, Newton or Kansas. It's uh, very extremely liberal out here, um, very diverse. It took me, and I'm a little conservative, so it's, it took me and it's still taking me a little bit getting used to uh, for how liberal it is here, but we do all right. This is a bridge that goes over the Bud Inlet. I just kind of liked how this all looked, the clouds. I liked how the street lights ran down and I figured, man, it would really look good in black and white. Being that we're a part of the Puget Sound, um, there's a lot of water in Olympia and where there's water, there are boats. 
Thurston County probably has, well, Olympia alone probably has four marinas and every spot where a boat could park, there's a boat parked. This particular photograph, I belong to a camera club out here called the Olympia Camera Club. And the challenge was to do photographs that have patterns. So I, I took this photograph through a, a fence, the fence creating the pattern and then the view behind it. This tall ship is the Lady Washington. The Lady Washington is the very boat where the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean was filmed on. The Lady Washington isn't uh, parked here or docked here. It's actually docked in Westport where that's about an hour from uh, Olympia. But it'll come down to Olympia two or three times a year. They do tours, you can hop on there and then they'll, they'll sail on through part of the Puget Sound. Each year in Olympia, they have a Labor Day thing and um, all the tugboats come in, they have tugboat races. And no matter how old the tugboats, no matter how new the tugboats, they come to Olympia. This is an older tugboat looking in at the, where the, the guy would steer it. It's called Harbor Days. This guy that says Sandman, that's a tugboat that was probably back from 1900. They keep it up. They have a, a, a group of people that maintain the Sandman. And on Harbor Days, they fire up the engines and the Sandman gets right in with the, red, the, the rest of the tugboats. If you ever come to Olympia, this is uh, the Sandman's right off of Percival Landing and you can go on the Sandman and they'll, they'll give you a tour. It's open uh, every weekend. So you can hop on there, you can see what a tugboat looks like and how it all works. At the Yacht Club, they provide sailboat lessons. So if you're looking to learn how to sail a boat, uh, you can hop on one of these and, and get a lesson in sailboating. And then you can move into the bigger class of sailboats, the large ones. I like this picture because of the way the water was. It almost was like a mirror. Uh, this was an HDR photograph that I used that really popped those colors. Uh, If you come down to the dock in the morning, you can guarantee there'll always be a mist going across the water, which opens you up for some wonderful photographs of the ocean, the boats, and the fog. They have little sailboat races too. And this day was a, a sailboat race, but they had to wait a little bit because as you can see in the background, it's really foggy. And uh, when they race, they're really close to each other and uh, without seeing each other, you'd be running into each other, which is not a good thing, but uh, I like the picture. I like the fog. I like the colorful boats. Here we are again down on the uh, Percival Landing. In the background there, those are the, uh, the Olympia Mountains. Those are probably two and a half hours from where we are. The mountains are amazing out here. Uh, Mount Rainier is, and you'll see a picture of that as we go along. Mount Rainier is about 50 miles from where we live. And you can actually see it as you drive to our house. In, when I first saw this thing, it's so massive, so huge, that it, it looked like somebody put it there. It didn't look real, like it was just placed on the, in the sky. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing scene. Sailboats, and it, 
Behind those sailboats are some apartment buildings. Housing is tough to come by out here. Uh, they keep trying to build and build and build. When we first came out here, I thought, well, we'll go ahead and spend $150,000 for a house. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, we'll have a, a real nice house and a lot of land. Well, that, that wasn't going to happen with the prices out here. So we ended up spending $230,000 for it's a three bedroom, two bath home. It's nothing spectacular, very little yard. And we, we live in a uh, cul-de-sac. That was in 2016 when we when we bought the house. Today, at the market value, we could sell this house for $393,000. And it would sell, if we would put it up on a Friday, it would be sold by Sunday. And you wouldn't get the, the asking price if we were asking $393,000. They bid it up. So most likely it would go for over $400,000. So why don't we sell? Well, because you'd have to buy another house and all the other houses are high dollar too. This was a photograph, obviously, of some boats on a dock. I use topaz a lot and I, I like how you can tweak the photographs and use the impression layers and the textures. And so I, I created this. I've never put a photograph in a contest or competition. I've never done any of that. But this one I went ahead and put into the Thurston County Fair, just, well, just to try. And it won a ribbon. First time I ever won a ribbon for any photograph I took. Kayaks, that's a very, very popular out here uh, because there's so much water. There's lakes, there's streams, there's oceans. The Pacific Ocean is out here too. And then, so you can go to the Pacific Ocean, although I don't know that they can kayak in an ocean, but the lakes are big and uh, kayaking is quite a sport. This is a place actually called Boston Harbor and it's in Thurston County. Um, those homes are lakefront properties, extremely expensive. And you're lucky if you ever see one come up for sale. This is Sunset on Bud Inlet. That's also right here in Olympia. That leads out to the Puget Sound. Well, that is the Puget Sound actually, but it'll lead out. You take that all the way toward the sun, you'll be heading toward the Pacific Ocean. They have a dock system that goes around Olympia, uh, as I was saying, was it's called Percival Landing. The dock is about one and a half miles if you were to walk it completely, and it's a great walk. Um, Karen and I will usually walk the docks two times a week, and it doesn't matter what season it is. It can be winter, it can be summer, fall, autumn. The weather is really pleasant here. Um, when we first came out here, everybody was in a panic because the winter was so cold and they're cold winters. It was 28 degrees and they were all in a huff that it was so cold. And uh, having come from Kansas, obviously we know what cold is like coming from Kansas. And we just thought it was pretty funny. And then the summer came around and uh, they said that the first summer we were here was just horribly, horribly hot. We had two days that it hit 90 degrees. That was the hottest it got. Normally it's down in the 70s or 80s. And so again, Karen and I got a kick out of that. But you know, you acclimate once you're in a place for a while. So now if it gets down to 28 degrees, we're cold. And if it gets up to 90 degrees, we're sweating. Most of the homes here don't have air conditioning. Most of the businesses don't have air conditioning. After the first summer, we decided we'd uh, put air conditioning into the house just in case we have any more of those 90 degree days.
It's a great place to walk, great exercise, and there's always something going on at the docks. Karen has become quite the bird lady since she's been here. She's learned that if she brings peanuts to the dock, that her bird friends will follow her around. And she's gotten so brave that she lets the seagulls uh, take the peanuts out of her hand. They got some sharp beaks too, they're pointy. She's gotten very good at that. Now when we go down there, I swear they recognize her because they'll follow her, not only the seagulls, but there's a lot of crows and ravens and they all follow Karen. The docks have sculpture and art, and every year they put in new sculpture and new art. And then when Harbor Day has come along, the people get to vote on what they think was the best sculpture on the boardwalk. And then that sculpture will usually sell to some business or goes somewhere, somewhere in the city. And then new sculptures come to the uh, boardwalk. The first year I was there, this was uh, what I saw, and I, I call this the rainy day girl. I just loved it. Um, having worked with uh, Child Advocacy Center heart to heart, this just reminded me of, uh, of working with heart to heart and the children. So I uh, took this photograph. We have a large Child Advocacy Center out here in Thurston County, very large. And uh, it didn't take me long. I think I was here just a few months and got in touch with that advocacy center, got involved with them, became a member of the board and gave them a large print of this, which hangs on the, uh, on the walls at the, uh, the center. As I said, the, there's different art that comes in. It's, it's really wonderful to see the creativity of people and, and the things they can do. Also at the dock, at the end of the dock, is the uh, farmer's market. And this farmer's market is open all year long. During the spring, it opens Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. As you get into the winter months, it'll only be open uh, Saturday and Sunday. Everything in the farmer's market is organic such as the foods, all the foods are organic. If there's anything else besides food, uh, such as products, it could be jewelry, it could be anything that they might be selling, candles, it all has to be handmade uh, from local artisans. In other words, you can't be getting, importing anything from China or Japan or anything else. It's gotta be handmade from this area. Washington is also known for its apples. At the farmer's market, they have bins and bins and bins of apples. And uh, you name the kind of apple and I swear it is grown here. Apples get shipped out and, and you're probably eating Washington apples there in Newton, Kansas. We also are, we also are known for our strawberries and blackberries these particular berries are grown right down the road from where we live. There's a huge field and it's the Spooner Berry Farm. You can either go out there and pick your own <clears throat> or if you're lazy like me, you can just buy them in the pints and that's what we do. <clears throat> Karen will uh, make uh, strawberry jam, blackberry jam, excuse me. <clears throat> It's delicious. And blueberries. They also have something called a Marion berry, which kind of is a, a cross of berries. All of it just very, very tasty. This is at the farmer's market. This is the Johnson Berry Farm, and they uh, make their own jams. And I've never had jams like this. There's one that's called a chocolate dipped raspberry jam. Man, that is good. And we've sold, oh, sold. We've, we've sent some of these out to Kansas. If uh, I think Mary and John Carr and Mary might be on here tonight, they've gotten some of the jams and they really like it too. 
ocean spray cranberries. They're out here and you can take a tour of their area and how all of that's done. Lots of things come from Washington. And of course, there's the salmon. These are pretty unique creatures. They, uh, every October and November, the salmon will come in from the ocean and find their way back to the very streams where they were born. And around November, or October, November, they are so thick, uh, it's, it's amazing. And they come up here, they spawn, they lay their eggs, and then most of the adults will die off. And then the baby salmon uh, take off and the cycle starts again. At the farmer's market, you can get fresh salmon and he'll cut up your filet and people love salmon. I'm not a fish eater, but I'm going to eat some salmon. I, I made it a promise that I would try salmon. And of course, everyone loves Brussels sprouts, not me, but if you like them, they've got them. And potatoes, you gotta have potatoes. They make their own soaps. They make lavender sprays. Lavender farms are big out here in Washington. Um, everything that could be lavender, lavender oil, lavender soap, lavender sprays, lavender uh, perfumes uh, come right from here in Washington. In fact, there's a lavender farm that's, oh, maybe 15 miles from where we live and we go visit every uh, year. We'll go out there and um, great people. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place. If you've ever seen lavenders, these are huge, big plants and they, they smell just wonderful. The docks also have a lot of entertainment on them. I call it music on the docks. Now these guys might look funny and they were, but man, could they play. So every time you go down there, you never know what you might see. There's always some guy strumming a guitar <clears throat> with his guitar case open, looking for some change or a buck or two. This guy was playing his banjo. <clears throat> and I asked him if he wouldn't mind if I could take a photograph of him. And he said, no, go right ahead. So I did. I entered this one in the fair under a black and white photograph. And it got me a, a blue ribbon. So now I won two ribbons, which I'm shocked. And of course, as I said, we have diversity out here. And that's, that's pretty diverse. And he wasn't bad. You don't have to go far from where you live to get back into the nature. This is um, also in Lacey. It's called, I call it the ponds. There's about five ponds. And in between all the ponds, they have paths that you can walk. So Karen and I will probably walk these about every day, unless it's really raining hard. Even if it's raining lightly, we'll still go out and walk uh, to walk the complete pond path goes about one and a half miles. So it's, it, if you have to get exercise and you need to walk, you couldn't think of a better place to walk at. So this brings us to birds. <clears throat> you know, while I was living in Newton, I really didn't know much about birds. I didn't really photograph birds. I would often go to Mary and John Carmen's house and they lived out in the country and, and they had birds and I loved looking at them, but didn't know much about them. So while I was here, I put up a hummingbird feeder and this is an Anna hummingbird. And these little guys have entertained me like I never thought I could be entertained. They're amazing creatures. 
This is a male Anna. He's actually sitting way, way, way on top of a, um, a tree that was out at the ponds. I had a, I've got a, a 150, 600 millimeter Tamron lens and that's cranked all the way to 600 to get this, this little guy. But he's watching out, he's checking everything out. He's got the, the top view. We have a honeysuckle bush in the backyard and the hummingbirds love to eat on the honeysuckle. So there was this guy and I just happened to have my camera out there and, and seen, seen her fly to the flowers and was able to get a shot. The golden finch is our state bird. This is a little feeder that I have hanging. And uh, I was lucky that one day, a couple of them landed on there. And as luck has it, I ran into the house, grabbed my camera. Normally when I do that and I come back out, they're all gone, but they were still there. So I got the shot. Pretty, pretty birds. This guy, him and his wife, have been living with us for, oh, four years, I would say. These are scrub jays. And I can tell it's the same ones. They've got markings and we know it's them. They come out, they'll come right to the fence because we feed them peanuts. And so when we're out, they come to the fence and they just watch us and they're looking at us just like this guy. He's waiting. He goes, where's the peanuts? So I've got a, a little tin can that I have hanging by the fence and I fill the can with peanuts. And then they go in, they take the peanuts and fly off. And they'll do it in teamwork. He'll come in, <clears throat> take off. His companion will be up in a uh, tree that's on the corner of the, the yard, a tall tree watching. And as soon as she sees he's got the peanut, takes off, then she comes in grabs the peanut and takes off. They're, they're quite a pair. Um, I, it's getting close where I thought eventually they'd, they'd come and eat out of my hand. Not quite, although they'll come right up to me. And uh, if the peanuts aren't there, they will squawk and we'll hear them in the morning waiting for breakfast. Beautiful birds. This is out at the pond. This is a, a, a swallow. These guys, they're, they're little and they fly fast. And they kind of remind me of, remember those balsa wood toy airplanes, those gliders and you would throw them and they would go all over the place. That's kind of what these swallows remind me of. I could never get a photograph of them in flight. They're just, I don't have a, a great camera like Jim Griggs does. He's got the camera that could probably capture this guy. But I just so happened to see him sitting on a branch. And I got him. That top one on the left, that's a western wood peewee. Over on the right, a kinglet. And down below, those are cedar wax wings. They have a unique yellow kind of edge to their uh, tail feather. Now you probably wonder, well, how do you know all the names? Well, I don't. I got this uh, app on my phone and I'll take a picture of the bird and I'll take a picture of the bird and put it on the app. And then the app will tell me what the bird is. Is it right all the time? No. Is it right most of the time? Yes. So whatever it tells me the name of the bird is, I might put it on Facebook and ask, is this a kinglet? And there happens to be a guy in, in uh, I think he lives in Park City, uh, a friend of mine who is a bird professional. He knows his birds and he'll let me know if I'm right or wrong. Sometimes I'm wrong and he, he'll correct me. This is a bush tit.
I've seen a lot of ducks, but usually they're always um, mallards and stuff like that. This is a uh, wood duck, and there's a lot of these wood ducks out here. They're beautiful. They have such colors. Uh, love, love the wood ducks. And they, they live in a tree. And of course, you can't have an ocean. And we are on the Pacific Ocean. That's what you see out there. That's the Pacific Ocean without seagulls. So here was this bunch of boys or girls or whatever they are. And I thought, boy, this is a perfect picture. The sun was kind of going down. And there they all are on these rock, this rocky stuff. And so I kept moving up, moving up. And it, I didn't bother them at all. And they were just looking out and got this photograph. And I also learned that there are all kinds of seagulls. There isn't just a seagull. There's numerous different and varieties of seagulls. So this is one of them, and I don't know the name of it. But that's a seagull, but it's actually some other kind of a gull. It has a different name. This was taken when Karen was feeding peanuts at the docks. And uh, this one was a curious gull and was flying over and I just was able to capture him. They'll let you get close because uh, they, they probably used to the humans on the docks. This is an osprey about a block from where we live, there's one of those tall towers. I think there's probably all the cable things are on there and the phone equipment, it's really tall. And in that tower, every year, uh, the ospreys build a nest and they'll have between two and three offspring. And once they get old enough and they fly from the nest and they actually come right over our house. They come over our house to get to a lake where they will uh, get fish and, and things like, like that. So I happen to be out with my camera and here comes this one right overhead and I snap them. This was at those ponds I, I heard this noise, this screeching noise, and I always thought that particular screeching noise was the sound of an eagle. Uh, however, it's not. It's a, a red-tailed hawk. And I don't know if you understand the screeching noise I'm kind of referring to. You usually hear it in, in uh, Western movies. <clears throat> and you always, I always have thought it was an eagle, but that friend of mine in Park City said, nope. That screeching sound comes from a red-tailed hawk. <clears throat> and these are Karen's buddies, the crows. Karen walks a lot. In the morning, she does about five miles every day. She takes her peanuts with her. And she has names. She's named these, these guys. She has the buddies. She has Speckles. She has Speckles' brother. And uh, they wait for her and they follow her throughout her walk. And when she comes, they'll follow her all the way back. And this has been going on for years and they recognize her now, the peanut lady. <clears throat> that shot on the right, <coughs> I couldn't pass it up. It was one of those days when the moon's out a full moon. It would have been better if the moon would have been behind the birds and I could have had uh, the front side of the birds, but it was what it was. So I had to get the picture of the moon and the birds with their backs towards me. Kind of unique picture. The red winged blackbird, beautiful sound. I uh, love hearing them. And that's again at the ponds, all kinds of birds at the ponds. The red-winged blackbird, that's the male. The female doesn't look anything like that, nothing like that. 
And of course, with a, you gotta have a robin if you're gonna take pictures of birds. You can like posing for me, just hanging out on that post, saying, come on, take the picture. A lot of herons, herrings. This one I just took um, this past weekend. We were walking the ponds and there's a path that goes up and then down and the the path that goes down takes you to the water. Well, as I was looking up the path, I saw this head peeking up. And so I call it a head of the rest. So I, I got that picture and of course I had to keep walking. Well, what it was is that's a male goose and his female goose was there and their babies, they were all just hanging out. That green stuff that you see, that's not algae, Steve. It's actually called duckweed, um, and that's they eat that. They're tiny, tiny little plants, duckweed. Aren't they cute? With the camera club I belong to, we always challenge ourselves with different kinds of photographic things. So this year we had a speaker um, talk about high key photography. Now I've never done high key photography ever before in my life. And, and pretty much what it is, is you're blasting white out there, uh, reducing all the shadows uh, and coming out with high key photography. So I set up a uh, little booth, um, what that that white is in the background that's a white cloth that i blasted with light from behind it and set up the daffodil in front and took the picture high key photography it's pretty cool We also have, uh, Karen and I have a, a YouTube channel called Embrace the Journey. And if you ever get on it, if you look through some of the videos, you'll see one called High Key Photography. And in that one, I, I actually go through the setup and what I did and the camera settings and how I made these photographs. So it's, a, it's kind of fun to watch. And all these plants and flowers, I would uh, run out to the backyard, grab one, come back in, put it in the living room, set it up, take a picture, grape hyacinths. We got, you know, right in the, in the early spring, these things. I had planted a number of bulbs around the yard, not knowing how they spread and, and uh, they're pretty. And I have a lot of grape hyacinths growing. These are English daisies. They were out there. I grabbed a few of them, threw them into the mix. What I could have done to make this picture much better, uh, and I'm just learning how to do that now, is stacking. Um, and I, I'll show you one later on as we go along. I did one today uh, with some stacking, and I'll show you that once we get to it. Again, the English, English daisies. The opposite of high key, low key. And that's where you're going to have a blackened out background as opposed to the white. And everybody's got to have a picture of the moon, don't you? Especially when it's so full and beautiful. You got to take a picture of the moon. So instead of the white background, I put on a, a black, you know, like a velvet cloth behind it and set up some lights onto the flower. This one, I'm actually outside when I took the photograph. <clears throat> I took a, it's a poster board, a black poster board and put it behind the plant 
and then went ahead and took the shot. A lot of these were, uh, my stop was probably at about one third of a second. I uh, used my an F stop probably close to eight or 11. Uh, I, I'm not stacking anything, I'm taking one shot. So using, of course, that at 11, eight or 11 will get me a sharper image. The seashell, I put it on uh, top of a mirror. So I had a, a reflection coming off the mirror of the shell. That's one of those English daisies again. A daffodil in low, in low key. These are called paper whites. Uh, they sell them at the farmer's market. They're just bulbs and you put them by your window and it takes two weeks and they bloom. And once they bloom, that's it. This is the one I took today. And this I did stack. This was my first try at stacking. Uh, this is actually 20 photographs that I stacked. I, I just bought a new camera, so I, I don't really know how it all works. It's a Nikon uh, Z6 Mark II. And Part of that in, within the camera has this stacking program you can do. Straws and other different things that I photographed. A spring on a mirror. Then we go into some fun photos I, I had. You know, it rains here a lot, so I get stuck in the house. You always got time to photograph things. Uh, I learned to use the flash at, a, at about a 1 16th power and it'll stop action like a dice going in a cup or maybe sugar going in a cup or sugar going in a teacup. The hardest thing about this is trying to get the stuff to land in the jar. So Karen would drop it and, and to to snap the picture while it's kind of midway. So it takes a few tries, but you eventually get it. Dice in a cup of water. And some macro, this is just colored pencils. I took some duct tape, I put it around the bottom of the pencils and attached them to a two by four block. I love marbles. I put marbles, marbles on top of a spatula and I shone light up under the spatula to come up around the marble. There you can kind of see the spatula. And I tried to get artsy, you know, with the marble and shadow and white. I like marbles. And you always got to experiment with something new. This is a fork that's in a, uh, like a Pyrex dish that has water in it. And under the Pyrex dish, that's a picture that came out of a magazine. And so that's the effect I get when I took that photo. The old bubbles. I think this was from some hand sanitizer. Shook up the bottle and did a macro of the bubbles. Grapes. I like the feather vase. Again, I use topaz to kind of blend, do some impression. Ferris wheel. Mount Rainier. <clears throat> Again, a beautiful mountain. And here's another little tidbit of information. Back in 1947, Ken Arnold, he was flying a, his own plane 
near Mount Rainier when he saw a string of nine shiny objects flying at what he estimated was 1,200 miles per hour. He was the first spotting of what he said looked like flying saucers. And so they got their name, flying saucers, right here at Mount Rainier. So we got flying saucers, we got Bigfoot. I haven't seen either one of them yet. This is a view of, of the mountain from the docks. It's so big, you, you just see it everywhere. And this is the view of the mountain from the ponds that we walk. This was a bizarre day. Another day where the moon is out during the day, it wasn't actually there, but I took a shot of the moon. The mountain had some bizarre cloud stuff going on and, and uh, Mount Rainier is known for its, uh, I think they call them lentil clouds, different cloud formations that form around it. So I took a picture of that and I placed the moon in that position. So it's a, a composite picture. Here we are going up to Mount Rainier and this is one of the, the uh, dry riverbeds. If the glacier melts and uh, it's a bad mud flow, it'll come flying down here, down on where this, all these rocks are. Being that we're on the coast, of course, there's a lot of lighthouses. And Karen and I took a trip one summer just to stop in and see all the different lighthouses. A lot of these are very old. Uh, they've been restoring most of them, bringing them back to life. But if you like lighthouses, there's plenty of them here. And then as you go further uh, south into Oregon, they're also there. It's called the 101, Highway 101. You'll see a whole lot of lighthouses. This is an old lighthouse up near Port Townsend. And uh, I also entered this one in a black and white and it, it won me another ribbon. A lot of different plants and fauna. These are meadow flowers, poppies, all different kinds of things, bachelor buttons. They have tulip farms out here. Tulips and mountains. And of course, a windmill. This year, of course, with COVID, uh, nobody was allowed to go through the tulip fields, but normally every year you can uh, take tours through the tulip fields. There's numerous, numerous tulip fields up in this particular county of Washington and lots and lots of photographic opportunities. Again, back at the ponds. I spend a lot of time there, take a lot of pictures. Most of this is right here in our yard. This top one up here, this one, <clears throat> that's called a skunk cabbage, also called a English lantern. That's not in the yard. Um, it's more into the wet areas. The rest of them are from our yard. Wild roses, again, there in the pond area. And of course, you can't have good flowers without good bees. Bainbridge Island, it actually is an island, it has a place called Bodell Reserve. This was a uh, loggers, a rich logger man's home, estate. It's now turned into a preserve where you can hike, walk around. It's just a, a beautiful, beautiful place. And we got seals. That seal is right 
down there right off of the Percival Landing, the Puget Sound. And they all get together every now and then, kind of like they do in Congress and the legislature, hanging out. And sea otters, these guys are fun and they're all over the place. This is a, a gardener snake. We have no venomous snakes here west of the mountains. There is no venomous snakes. Now, if you get onto the other side of Washington to the eastern side, the eastern side of the mountains, yeah, they'll have rattlesnakes and stuff like that, but they don't exist over here. And now, not only did we do we have a granddaughter, but we've got a grandson too. And so we've got two grandkids and we love it. That about wraps it up. As I was <clears throat> telling you, we have a YouTube channel. It's not the greatest thing on the face of the earth. Uh, we don't have one thing that we do. We do tons of things. We take walks out on the trails. Uh, Karen does craft projects. We just did a landscaping film, did some photography things. So, you know, if you're bored and you got nothing better to do, go over Google Townsend Walton on YouTube and you'll find me. It's called Embrace the Journey and uh, subscribe to me and you'll get to see one of these things. We put one out every week, just a bunch of fun. And that's it. That's all I got. So Dan, I don't know how to get the screen back uh, to you. Um, just, uh, I can see here. Uh, I can stop it here. Um, and we've got a few uh, questions. So if you have questions, uh, please uh, ask them in the comments or using the Q&A thing. But I do have a couple of questions here in the Q&A. Um, Phil asked, are most of your shots done with a tri or monopod? They're all done by hand. I don't use, okay. uh, unless it's the, the ones where it's kind of the studio setup, the low key, high key. Yeah, those were with tripods, but most of my photography is done freehand with, without a tripod. Um, and then he, Phil also wanted to know what lens uh, do you use for bird shots? I'm pretty much on that Tamron 150, 600 G2 lens. Um, for the price, I, I think it, you can't beat it. Uh, it's about a $1,200. It's probably cheaper now. When I got it, it was about a $1,200 lens. It might be, it may be cheaper at this point. Um, and on oh, what sorry. I have attached to is a Nikon D610. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't tried it on this new camera that I have, which is the, the Nikon, um, Z6 Mark II. Uh, from what I understand and from the reading I've been doing, I think the focusing will be a lot better on that particular camera than the 610. Um, and then just so anyone watching on Facebook Live, if you leave a comment, I will also ask uh, T as well. Um, but Denny asked, uh, how close do the hummingbirds let you get? The hummingbirds have being that they know us now, they'll come right to us. They'll, they'll come within inches of us and they'll just flutter in front of our face. They'll check us out. Uh, I can get really close to them when they're on the feeders, uh, the ones that know me and it's kind of nice. We're Does anyone to get them to oh. eat out of our hands? I think maybe this summer we'll, we'll yeah. achieve that. <laughs> that that would be pretty 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 cool. I don't. I'll have to check watch for some pictures of that. <laughs> um, does anyone else have uh, any questions for T? Well, um, if we don't have any more questions, T, thank you so much for coming and uh, your wonderful presentation. The pictures were fantastic. 
Thank you. And it was a, <clears throat> a pleasure doing it. I've never done one of these as a presenter before, but um, it's nice seeing every, well, I didn't see anybody, but uh, <laughs> nice to know that there are people out there that, yeah. that know me and yeah. recognize me. So, well, thank you everyone for uh, also attending our program tonight. And uh, I will close this down for the evening. Um, thank you again all for coming. Bye-bye.